Hallelujah. Okay, let's just pray. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're with me because I can't do this without you. Uh, but Lord, I pray today that uh, the word that you give me and I, as I speak it, Father God, that you will divide it, Lord, in as many parts as you see fit so that every single person will take something home with them today. So Lord, I just want to uh, just give this time over to you in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, the title of uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about is your defender. Um, having gone through life, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure you're exactly the same, that sometimes you find that um, some people are not for you. They're against you. Amen? A lot of people say stuff about you that isn't quite true. They come against you. They push things <laughs> upon you which you actually don't like. And it's really quite difficult. How about people making decisions for you that are really not really good decisions at all for you? Okay, but you've got, you've, you know, you just have to run with it. And actually it affects the rest of your life. It's not nice. The thing is, that if you think that, haha, you know what, I'm going to go and straighten people out. I mean, I've done that. You know what, you're messing with the wrong person. I'm going to tell you what for. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been there? Because I have. But I've actually found out it was just a waste of time because I spent so much energy fighting those stupid battles that I'm like, you know what, what is the point? Seriously? And... I've also discovered that I spent so much time trying to find those battles, actually, that it took my focus off what I was supposed to be desiring, what God wanted me to do, and what were my goals, because I was so worried about what other people were saying about me. <clears throat> it just takes up so much energy, I'm telling you. But what I want to tell you, you know what, that there is a key, and the key is that He is your defender. Amen? He is the protector of your um, reputation. You know, when I say he, I mean God, the almighty, the faithful one, the one who loves you with an everlasting love, your provider, your guider. He sends his Holy Spirit to empower you. He is just amazing. He is the forgiver, right? He is full of mercy. He doesn't judge you. He's the one that will defend you. You don't have to defend yourself. <clears throat> you know what? You might even think, you know what? I'm quite a good person. I go to work. I provide for my family. I'm an ace mom. I do everything that my kids want me to do. <laughs> you know, I can, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? That's, that's the way we should think. But you might think, actually, do you know what? I don't deserve any of this. You know what? None of us do. None of us do. The thing is, do you know that Jesus, when he was on the earth, what did he do? He did nothing, nothing but good. Right? He stood there. He preached. He forgave. He taught people how to live, how to act. He healed the sick that were among them. Those that had trodden down, he pulled them up. And yet he was accused. He was accused. Just have a look at Mark 15, verse 13. Mark 15, verse 13. And this is what it says. And the chief priests accused him of many things. Many things. Have you been accused of many things? <laughs> Do you know what? Um, I have three of my own children and I have five stepsons. Let me tell you, through my life, I have been accused of some stuff. <laughs> I've been accused of favoritism. If your kids were in this house, they, they, you would allow them to do this kind of stuff. And oh boy, you know what? I was just like, where the heck is that coming from? But one thing I did know, that when I was going through a hard time, God said to me, you know what, Lynn? I put you in that family. And I was, yes, I'm staying here no matter what they chuck at me. I'm going to fight and I'm going to stand and I'm going to show them the true way. <laughs> and that was just to love them through it all. It doesn't matter. God is my defender. Okay, so what about putting your reputation in God's hands, you see? Because through all that, 
when God, when they were accusing him of God in Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Mark 15, 3, it says at the end there, but he answered nothing. Okay, they accused him of many things, but he just stood there. Can you, can you actually imagine these people coming and accusing him of doing stuff and he stood there? You know what, I bet he stood there tall with his head up high looking up to the sky. Up to his father thinking, ha ha, you don't know what you're doing. What an attitude. What a way. You know what, we can really learn something just from that verse. He never said a single thing. Oh boy, I need, I need to learn from this because sometimes my mouth just goes away with me when people say stuff. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> the thing is, God will... Uh, vindicate you better than you can vindicate yourself. Yeah. Amen? <clears throat> so don't pay people back. He is the true defender. He is the true defender. Listen, when, God pu when people push you down, God will lift you up. Yes. When he people make you look bad, He's going to make you look good. Yeah. He's going to make you shine. Yeah. Amen? Amen? I want to tell you about how God def defended Sarah. And we're going to read uh, from the book of Genesis from verses 2 to 6. Now, the background story of this is that Abraham and Sarah, they left the land of Ur. And they were on their way to the promised land. Okay, And all of a sudden, Abraham heard that the king was going to kill him. So he thought to himself, how am I going to get out of this? So we're going to pick the story up in verse 2. Genesis chapter 20, thank you. <laughs> Genesis chapter 20, verses 2 to 6. Now Abraham said to his wife, she's my sister. And Amimelech, king of Gera, sent and he took Sarah. Now ladies, I don't know how you'd feel, but if John turned around to all of you and said, actually, she's just my sister. <laughs> How about that? She's just my sister. In theory, she was partly his sister, but actually, he, he wasn't the wife in this particular instance. That's what Abraham was implying, okay? But I would actually feel really unloved, unworthy, unwanted. I'd actually be quite afraid of what was going to happen to me. And I think I'd be really angry with John, <laughs> you know? Oh, I tell you. So verse, verse 3. Okay. But God came to Amimelech in a dream by night, and he said to him, Indeed, you're a dead man. Because of the woman you have taken, she is a man's wife. Verse 5. Did he not say to me, she's my sister? And she, even she herself, said, he's my brother? In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. You see, this is when I say to yourself, you know, you are good people. You are good people. It happens to good people that people say stuff about you. They do stuff to you. Yeah. This man was an honest man. He was full of integrity. And verse 6 says, And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. So how amazing was that? God not only defended Sarah in this instance, but he also defended the king from doing wrong. How amazing. He is just so merciful. He defended both of them in that particular situation. <clears throat> What about the story of Hagar and Ishmael? You know the story about um, Abraham was promised a child and Sarah decided that this child wasn't coming so she says to Hagar, you know, well, you go off with Abraham and you can have a child and that'll, that'll solve everything. It'll be absolutely great. <laughs> so that's exactly what happens. And then Sarah herself, she has um, Isaac. But as time goes on, Sarah actually gets really, really jealous and upset with the relationship that uh, Abraham has with Ishmael. 
and she gets really fed up. She don't like this at all. And she says to Abraham, well, actually, do you know what? Your seed and the inheritance and everything belongs to Isaac, and that's who it should belong to. So I want to tell you to get rid of that woman and the boy, and I want them to go away. Poor Hagar. Poor Hagar, how she was used. She was a faithful servant to Sarah. Then she was used to have a child, and now all of a sudden she's getting chucked out of the flock. Off you go. Go on your own. Bye. Buzz off. Wow. I'm just like, oh, I cannot imagine how she must have felt. Let's have a look at this. Um, Genesis 21. Genesis 21, Israel. <laughs> Verses 14 to 21. So uh, Abraham obviously comes to Hagar and he says to Hagar, Hagar, you know, you've got to go. Bye-bye. I'm so sorry, but uh, it's time for you to go. You need to go and take the boy away. So this is how we pick up the story. So Abraham rose early in the morning. Uh, he took bread and he skin, took a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it uh, and to the boy, to Hagar, and he sent her away. Then she departed, and she wandered in the wilderness of Bathsheba. Verse 15. Uh, and the water and the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under the shrubs. So it was very hot, obviously, in those days. We know what it was like uh, out there. It's always very hot. And uh, they were obviously in the wilderness. They had no food, no water. And she looked like she was right, real desperate. Her son was going to die. And verse 16, <clears throat> then she went and she sat across from him at a distance under a bow shot. I had to say to John, what does a bow shot mean? <laughs> and apparently it's as far as an arrow can shoot. So it was, it obviously it was quite a way that she sat away from the boy. And, uh, and she said to herself, let me not see death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and, and lifted her voice and she wept. Wow, what she must have gone through. Can you imagine mom's doing that for your kids? Seeing your son over there under this bush, he's, he's got no water, he's going to die, it's that hot. What am I going to do? There's nothing around, we're in the wilderness. And verse 17, and God heard the voice of the lad. So obviously the, the lad was obviously praying as well. And then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not. For God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, and I will make him a great nation. Okay, he was about to die, and yet God made him a great nation. Amen? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Verse 19, then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. That's a miracle. There was nothing there. All right, okay, all of a sudden, he opened her eyes, and there was this, this water. And she went and she filled the, the, the skin of water, and she gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew, and he dwelt in the wilderness, and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him in the land of Egypt. See, once again, how God defended Hagar and Ishmael. Can you imagine that story of how that poor woman, what she actually went through? And yet, again, well, I can't say, again, maybe she didn't defend herself, but she didn't have any grounds to defend herself because she was actually a servant and she had to go. She had to be cast out. And yet God looked after and he protected her. And look, he made the son a great nation. What about Mordecai? Mordecai, he was a real kind gentleman. He, he took in his, his, his young cousin, who was an orphan, Esther, and he looked after her and he brought her up. And then obviously, you know the story that Esther was taken into the king's palace and she was prepared uh, to marry the king. Uh, and in that time, um, Mordecai was actually uh, promoted and he was able to sit in the, kids, in the king's gates. And there while he was sitting in the king's gates, he heard um, about a plot by two eunuchs that were going to overthrow the king and they wanted to kill him. Uh, so Mordecai, because of the situation where he was and where he represented, he was able to get word to the king about what had actually happened. So he saved the king's life.
And in those days, anything that ever happened was recorded in the Chronicles. Okay? I, I don't know if you know, some time ago they did a census. That's going back real years ago. Do you remember when they did a census in the UK and everybody's had to sign something and everybody was logged and everything? Well, it's the same kind of thing then, but everything that happened, it was written down. <clears throat> So this one particular night, what happened was the king couldn't sleep. So he said to his servant, bring me the chronicles and will you please read them to me? I found that really strange, but anyway. <laughs> so he was there <clears throat> and he told, he read the story about how Mordecai had saved the king's life. So the king said to him, oh, hold on a minute. Was Mordecai ever rewarded? Was he ever honored for saving my life? And because everything is supposed to be recorded, okay, the servant said, no, he never was. And then at that particular time, Haman, we know about Haman, didn't he? He actually decided that he didn't like Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. And he was really out to get him. In fact, he had just prepared the gallows to go and have Mordecai hanged. And he decided that he was about to go into the king's palace and say to the king, uh, guess what, Mordecai won't bow down to him. I think, you know, he needs to go to the gallows. So he's about to walk into the palace when the king says, um, hold on a minute, uh, Hagar, uh, sorry, not Hagar, hang, ha, ha, help me, Haman. Haman. <clears throat> hang on, Haman, let me tell you something. If a man had protected the king and saved him from dying, mm. right, what shall we do? How should we honor him? Aha, and he thought it was going to be him. So he said, well, I think you should put the royal coat on and you should put him on a horse and you should portray, uh, pull him through the streets and everybody should, you know, ha ha, great man. <laughs> so the king says, great, go and do that to Mordecai. Okay. You see how God defended him? <clears throat> Amen. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're going through. God will defend you. Yeah. He is amazing, absolutely amazing. He knows it. You know, even this morning when I put on, everybody was rich, okay, when they took up the offering, when they went into the, the, into the inner circle there, and they were putting their money in. But God spotted the widow's might, which was virtually nothing. But he knew. He knew. So no matter what you're ever going through, he knows. <clears throat> he knows. Hallelujah. Oh boy, thank you, Jesus. There's somebody else that, Je that Jesus uh, defended. And uh, we're going to read that in John 8, verses 3 to 11. <coughs> it's about the woman that was caught in adultery. <coughs> I think it's just an amazing story. Just wow. Uh, it starts with that early one morning, Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives, which is a really beautiful place. And he went there and he began to, to teach, right? He sat down and he just began to teach because there were so many people there. And uh, we'll pick it up in verse 3. Uh, uh, then the, the, the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the mist, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery, the very act. Can you imagine how the woman must have been feeling? She must have been very fearful, humiliated, caught in the act, yanked from the covers, dragged through the streets. Dragged through the streets. I wonder, you know, was she covering her face? Was she crying? Was she pleading? Was she silent? But she, she didn't know that she was uh, in a state where her reputation was on the line. She was never going to outlive this one ever, ever again. Because she had violated the law, basically. We don't know how, we don't know what drove her to it. You know? Had she been seduced? Was she forced? Did she give in a moment of weakness? Why? What happened? I thought about this in great deal. And you know, when, you, when we read the scriptures, you'll begin to see that it wasn't really about the woman caught in adultery. It was a test. And I wonder if it wasn't actually a plot and everybody knew exactly they had conjured it up. Okay, because where's the man? Hello? Where's the man? 
Yeah, you know, only the woman was brought. Yeah. Okay, verses, uh, verse, John 8, verse 5. So the, the Pharisees continued saying, Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They said to Jesus. What do you say? Okay, verse 6. This is when it says, uh, This they said, testing him. Okay, this is why I think to myself, Hmm, they were testing him. Well, how did they know that this woman was doing what she was doing? It must have been a plot. But Jesus stooped down. And he wrote on the ground with his finger, as if he didn't hear a thing. <clears throat> Can you imagine that there's this woman standing there? She's probably got a blanket or something wrapped around her. Right? The, the, the synagogue is full of people. This rabbi Jesus is all of a sudden, he's on the ground and he's writing with his finger. What did he do? He actually took the attention of his eye off the woman and everybody was looking at him because he had bent down because they were asking him a question and he wasn't actually answering it. I think to myself, I wonder what he was writing. Was he writing the man's name that had also been in adultery? You know? Had he been jotting down all the sins of all the Pharisees that were, you know, trying to get a plot to him to say something? <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 7. And when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said, Who is without sin among you? Who is without sin among you? Let him throw the first stone. And verse 8, and again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Okay, so he was turning the whole situation around. I cannot imagine uh, what this lady must have been going through at that particular time. Um, everybody's eyes all of a sudden were back on Jesus. She was there one minute. They were saying, you know, what are you going to do? Do you say that she needs to be stoned? And he stood up and said, if you were without sin, go ahead. But if you were sin, you know, like, stop. And she was like, oh. Oh, and all of a sudden, he stood down again. Everybody's eyes were taken off her again. And they were on him. Verse 9. And those who heard it, being convicted, <coughs> excuse me, of their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman was standing in his midst. Verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and he saw that no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen. Amen. Can you imagine how God defended her? an act that was actually uh, by law written down that this person needed to be stoned and yet he turned it around he was an amazing defender he can do nothing but defend you you know so no matter what you're going through no matter what somebody has chucked at you don't retaliate. Don't say, do you know what? I can't handle this. Yes, you can. Because with God, you can do all things. But, you know, just remember that he is your defender. He will lift you up. He will not ever bring you down. <clears throat> uh, on, a, on a personal note, I want to share something that happened to me many years ago. Um, my, my son, I'm trying to think how old he was. He must have been about nine years old. And um, he went to a private school in London. And um, my, my, at the time, I was still married to my ex-husband. And um, we, had, we had lots of money. And so we could quite easily afford to send him to, to a private school. 
And, uh, uh, but our marriage had uh, deteriorated and he moved out. We didn't know really where he was. I just knew he was living in Saudi Arabia. And it was time to have the school fees paid, <laughs> which at that time was about 3,000 pounds a term. And I thought to myself, oh dear Lord, what am I going to do here? Because I don't have 3,000 um, pounds. And I thought, oh, anyway, I went to my pastor and I shared it with him. And he said, don't worry. He said, we'll pray. He said, go. And, you know, God will give you favor. So I made an appointment to the bursar and I went. And um, I, I, I went to the bursar and I said, unfortunately, my husband and I, we've split up. And I don't really know where he is. As far as I know, he's in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's not giving me any money for the children. And um, I can't afford to pay Simon's school fees. There is an assisted place which you can apply for, you see. And I said, I would like to apply for this assisted place. Well, he said to me, are you getting a divorce? Well, no, because I'm a Christian. <laughs> are you getting a legal separation? Well, no, because I'm a Christian, because that's not what I want. I believe God's going to restore my marriage and going to bring my husband back. And uh, anyway, this guy obviously thought I was a real cuckoo, but he was really nasty to me. And I left there in tears, really, really upset, because basically he said to me, unless I go to the courts and I get a legal separation or I get a divorce, they wouldn't even entertain it, because who am I to say that I could come here and ask for an assisted place, which I basically understand. Some people do trample the wool over people's eyes. <clears throat> anyway, I was really upset and I phoned my pastor and I said, this is what happened. And he said, no, he said, we're not having that. He said, make another appointment. And he said, I'll come with you this time. So I said, okay, you know, I'd go like with Pastor Reba any day. <laughs> but anyway, this is not my, not my current pastor, my old pastor. And so we went and uh, we got there in the morning. Our appointment was at nine o'clock because he was a businessman. My pastor was also a businessman. And uh, we waited and waited. And I don't know if you know, private schools are very emerald-like. They are dead on time, you know. School bell goes, kids walk in, kids walk out. It's very like, and I'm like, something's wrong. It's like 20 past nine and we're still waiting to see the bursa. When the bursa secretary came, um, she said to me, you know, you Mrs. Kane, who I was at the time, and I said, yes, and he, she said, I'm very sorry to say this, she said, but um, the bursa's had a heart attack last night and uh, he's actually died and we actually don't know what to do right now, so can we please postpone this meeting? And uh, she said, um, don't worry about Simon's school fees. He will not be chucked out of the school until we can find a new bursa. We will look at all of this again. But please just keep Simon at school. That, that will be fine. Anyway, it was about three or four months later when they did eventually find a bursa. And he wrote to me saying, you know, you better come and see me. And I thought, oh boy, anyway. And, uh, but you know what? The same thing. I went in with the same story and that bursa found favor with me. And Simon got a sister place for the rest of his school life. You know. <laughs> So God defended me. Yeah. I know it's really sad to say that that bursa, I'm not saying that, you know, he died because of me, but it was just to happen that that particular day, that, that's exactly what happened. But God had turned that situation around for me to get that assisted place. He defended me. I didn't have to do anything, you know. But God is so good. And, you know, sometimes mums, I think to myself, you know, um, we try our best all the time. At every single thing, you know, we give and we give and we give and we give. And sometimes you get stuff thrown at you by your own kids, you know. I don't like you. I don't want you living in this house. I'm moving out. Who do you think you are speaking to me? You know, you get kids that are really nasty sometimes, you know. But you know what? Just let God defend you. He'll turn it around. You know, every single one of you are so precious in his sight, men included. That's why I wanted to put the story about Mordecai. Men, even you, no matter what you're going through, God can defend you. You know, he is the defender. Isn't there a scripture about he's the defender of the weak? Yes. You know, <laughs> yeah. bless God. So, you know, I just want you really to be encouraged and to really just take that, you know what? God will defend you. You just have to trust him. When you can say, actually, you know what, God, hand on heart, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm not going to this, do this anymore. I'm going to trust you to take care of this particular situation. That's when he'll step in because the Holy Spirit is, he's a gentleman and he won't come in and try and take over. He'll just let you wait. He'll let you hey, stand back. Let me deal with this. You know what? Because he will turn it around better than you ever could. Amen. So thank you. And mothers, you know, I wanted to cut it a little bit short because I want you to go and get spoiled by your husbands and by your children. <laughs> so God bless you and I hope you have a really, really special Mother's Day.
Amen. Thank you.